before the main movie starts, I'd just like to say a few words about Jill. We met in the late 1980s and then fished together for several seasons on the rivers Team and Seven. She was, without any doubt, one of the best anglers I've ever met. And these are photos of some of her captures from those rivers. Not only did Jill and I fish together, but we built fishing rods together with the brand name of Sear. Now her rod finishing skills were second to none, and many people, including myself, are still using the rods that she built today. In the following movie, Jill describes very capably how to build a fishing rod at home and also how to make a few repairs. Enjoy. The first stage before building a rod at home is to gather together a few necessary tools and essential rod building materials. First of all something like this small file which is useful for filing down the feet of the rod guides, small paintbrush, some scissors, a sharp knife, some masking tape or similar tape, some sandpaper, a tape measure for measuring the spaces between the rod guides, a razor blade which is useful for the whipping thread, some rod cleaner which is very useful for cleaning down the blank before you start, some hot melt glue, we have some two part adhesive for the handle components, some whipping sealer for the whipping thread, obviously the whipping threads there and a two part epoxy resin to finally coat the whippings with. The first stage in building a fishing rod is to make the handle and today I'm going to show you how to make two different types. First a fly rod handle using a pre-shaped cork grip and a Wayland screw fitting. Secondly an abbreviated Duplon handle using a Fuji DPS fitting which can be used on many different types of coarse and sea rods. To build a trout fly rod you must first glue the real fitting to the bottom of the rod blank using masking tape to ensure a tight fit. First measure the length of the reel fitting against the rod blank. Then using the masking tape build up several layers to match the internal diameter of the reel fitting. Now this is still too loose so I need to build up a few more layers to make a tighter fit. After wrapping on the tape Mix together equal amounts of ProBond resin and hardener. Then when fully mixed, coat the blank and the masking tape and then slide on the reel fitting.
Then allow 24 hours for the adhesive to set. The real fitting is now glued securely and it is now time to glue on the pre-shaped cork grip. To ensure a firm bond, it is best to roughen the surface of the rod blank with some sandpaper. When that's done, clean off the dust with a bit of cloth. Then using the small file, roughen the end of the reel seat that will fit into the recess of the cork grip. A quick wipe with the cloth and it's now time to apply the Pro Bond adhesive to the blank and the end of the reel seat. enough adhesive. I can now slip the cork grip down the rod blank and over the reel seat. Make sure it's a snug fit and wipe off any excess glue with a cloth. To make an abbreviated Duplon handle, you must first fit the tapered butt grip. Wipe off any excess glue with a cloth. The next stage is to fit the Fuji DPS screw fitting, but before that you need to slide down the Duplon cone. Obviously the position of the reel seat will depend on the type of rod that you are building. As with the fly rod, you may need to use masking tape to ensure a tight fit to the blank. Once you've ensured a tight fit, you can then apply the Pro Bond adhesive. I have now positioned the real fitting and need to apply adhesive here and here before sliding the Duplon cones up to the ends of the real fitting. And that's what the completed abbreviated Duplon handle should look like. The last thing I need to do is to fit the Wayland BMB button into the end of the rod blank, into which I've already put some glue. You may need to wrap masking tape around the stem of the button to ensure a tight fit. Don't forget, Jill has made just one type of Duplon handle. There is a large range of Wayland and Fuji components available, enabling many different types of rod handles to be made.
Once you've built your handle of your choice, it's time to do some whipping. You may find it very useful to build some kind of rod support. Here we've made two using two blocks of wood and a couple of rod rests. The whippings by the rod handle are merely to make the rod look nice. Here I've used brown thread with a red tipping. Now I'll show you how I did that by doing another whipping here. Before you start whipping, you may find it easiest to secure the end of the whipping thread with some masking tape. Then turn the rod, gradually building up several layers of whipping thread. After about five turns, cut off the loose end of the thread with a raised blade. the tape and the loose end. Then continue and gradually build up a block of thread. Also remembering to keep the whipping thread quite tight. And as you go, push the threads together just to make sure that you don't get any gaps. Then about eight turns from the end of the whipping, take your loop and put it underneath the actual thread and then whip over it. Then putting your finger on the thread, cut off the end and actually place the loose end through the loop of the thread. Then pull the loop through nice and tightly. And there you have the finished block of thread. Finally cut off the loose end with a pair of scissors as close to the whipping thread as possible as this will be neatened up at a later stage. The next stage is to create a coloured tipping which is basically a mini version of the main whipping. The only difference being that you need to start off with the loop of thread straight away. Remembering to keep the whipping thread quite tight as you go along. Finally. Trim the end of the thread and pull it through the loop, making sure it's nice and tight. This then can be trimmed off with the razor blade. And also the loose end with the tape pushing the threads together to ensure there are no gaps. Then discard the tape and the loose end. And that's it, finished. Now that I've finished with the Duplon handle, I'll demonstrate how to whip on the same old keeper ring above the fly handle. You'll notice I've already fitted a Wayland collar. Use masking tape to attach the keeper ring to the blank. Then whip from the collar up and over the foot of the keeper ring. Making sure that you keep the thread tight as you go along. pushing together the threads at the same time to fill in any gaps.
Then finish off with a loop of thread. And then do exactly the same on the opposite side of the keeper ring. You can add a coloured tipping of your choice. The next whippings you should do are over the male and female ferrules. These are not just cosmetic, they help to strengthen the joints. We recommend ferrule whippings of at least one inch on fly rods, one and a half inches on coarse rods and two inches on sea rods. Some powerful casting rods may need ferrule whippings of several inches. It's now time to consider the rings for your hand-built rod. There is an enormous variety available and you should seek advice from your rod blank supplier on the correct type, size and ring spacings for the rod. You'll find advice on the types, sizes and spacings provided on the inside of your video's cover. The first stage in ringing a rod is to glue on the tip ring and you'll need some hot melt glue, a candle, some sandpaper and a small cloth to wipe off any excess glue. First roughen the end of the rod tip with the sandpaper. Then melt the glue in the candle flame. Cover the rod tip and attach the tip ring. Wipe off any excess glue with the cloth. Samo hot melt glue is perfect for tip rings because it enables easy repositioning and also removal in case of repair. I've now gathered together a full set of Fuji silicon carbide rod guides and I've marked their position on the rod blank by using the tape measure and thin strips of masking tape. Before whipping on the guides you may need to file down their feet to enable the whipping thread to build up neatly without any unsightly gaps. I've now attached the rod guide to the blank with the masking tape and will whip up and over the guide foot. Starting a few turns from the actual foot of the guide, we'll start the whipping. Pushing the threads together as you go along to fill in any gaps. Then trim off the loose end. Keeping the thread quite tight as you go along. Once you've reached the masking tape, just remove that and carry on whipping to the end of the foot. A few turns from the end, place your loop underneath the thread as before and carry on whipping until the end. Put the 
loose end through the loop. Pull nice and tightly. There we have it, the finished whipping. If you wish, you may add a tipping of your choice. The next stage is to varnish the whippings, but first you must coat them with Pro Rod Sealer as this will preserve their colour. Apply the sealer with the aid of a brush. Making sure that you coat all of the whippings well. Once the sealer has dried, you can trim off any thread stubs with a very sharp razor blade. You now have a choice of using Pro Rod Varnish or the Pro Rod Epoxy System to coat and protect the whippings. The varnish is easier to use but needs several coats to achieve a good protective layer. The two-part epoxy system requires more care to use but results in a superb and tough finish requiring only one or two coats. Applying the Pro Rod varnish couldn't be easier. Using a brush, apply several thin coats, allowing an hour to dry between each application Then clean your brush in water. Most professional rod builders use a two-part epoxy resin system to coat rod whippings and I'd recommend the Pro Gloss system for home use. In a warm room, you must mix the resin and hardener in an equal 50-50 ratio by counting the drops from the nozzles. Use any small dish, but line it with kitchen foil. The mixture must be stirred thoroughly. Once the mixture is ready, apply a coat to the whippings using a brush. Bear in mind that the mixture may start to harden after several minutes. Once you've achieved a uniform coat, wash your brush in cellulose thinners. The epoxy varnish will take several hours to dry and unless you turn the rod blank 90 degrees every few minutes, during this time the varnish may drip into an unsightly lump. Apply a second coat if needed a day after applying the first one. An alternative to manually turning the rod every few minutes is to rig up a system with a barbecue motor. These can be bought from most garden centres. These motors will turn the rod slowly for several hours. One subject I've not yet covered is rod graphics and there are two main ways of producing these at home. 
The first method is to use paint and a tiny brush, but I'd stress that this can be difficult unless you have a very steady hand. The second and easiest method for inexperienced rod builders is to use rub-on transfers which can be bought from any large stationers. Use a soft pencil to rub the letters onto the rod blank and then coat with Pro Rod Varnish or Pro Rod Epoxy. The last subject I want to cover is rod repair. One of the most common that can be tackled at home is to replace a damaged rod ring. Removing a damaged ring can be difficult and potentially dangerous because modern epoxy varnishes can be very tough. Using a sharp knife, cut away the varnish and the whipping from the ring foot. Always cut in a direction away from your fingers. Once you've removed the ring, you can then remove the rest of the varnish and whipping thread and then whip on a new ring as shown earlier. I will now show you how to mend a broken rod blank. You'll need some Pro Bond adhesive, a thin rod, a small piece of tapered carbon that you may be able to get from an old rod or local tackle shop. You'll also need some masking tape and small piece of cloth. First wrap masking tape around the two broken sections. This will prevent them splitting when you glue in the piece of carbon. Smear adhesive on the thicker piece of tapered carbon. Using the thin rod, push the piece of tapered carbon into the rod blank until half of it protrudes. Then smear adhesive onto the exposed section. Then push on the other broken piece of rod blank. And wipe off any excess adhesive. Check that the rings are in line and leave for 24 hours. Once you are certain the adhesive is set, cover the joint in a whipping of at least 3 inches, then varnish or epoxy. The last easy repair I want to show you is how to remove unsightly dents from Duplon. All you do is pour boiling water over it and it resumes its original shape. Well, I hope you enjoyed the movie and found it useful. You may have noticed that there's no mention of rod ring spacing. That's because when the movie was first released, that information was contained within a video insert. Nowadays, you can get the information from the internet or by visiting your local tackle dealer.